Um, and that to me is impressive when you have that much. And these aren't, other than the Mercedes trilogy and the Dark Tower series, none of these books are connected. Well, you have uh, <coughs> The Shining and Dr. Sleep. But when you have that many, uh, you have authors like Lawrence Block or Dean Coons who deal in series all the time. It's not that impressive when you got 20, you know, 20 to 40 books and they all tie together with the same character. We're talking about 60 plus books and in almost every single one of those books except for maybe 10 of them, it's all unique casts. And he's somehow still churning out new, fresh characters. His newest novel, The Outsider, has several types of characters I've never read about, period, much less read from him. So that's, that's his staying power for me, is the, not only the world that he's created, but how small he keeps the world like it's his own small town. Well, yeah, I absolutely think that the, the blue-collar storyteller isn't that one of the things that really has stayed, because to make a comparison to Lovecraft, because I think Lovecraft, Lovecraft wasn't an early influence of Stephen King. I think he's, he's an early influence of most anyone who writes in the horror genre. Lovecraft himself has his own section of the New England area where there are his own fictional towns that are connected. His stories call back to each other. The thing about Lovecraft was that there's no, there isn't really any um, consistent uh, continuity between the books because, like, he didn't really take his the idea of a mythos very seriously. So, like, he would reuse ideas. He'd be like, oh, "That's a pretty good idea." And so, like, you can find a lot of continuity here because he didn't really, he wasn't really writing it that particularly that in mind. Whereas King took it and. He decided, yeah, he decided to make the New England area a place of where, like, where the supernatural can happen, where aliens and demons seem yeah. to converge and supernatural people haunted. Um, and one of the things I think that's so interesting about that, whereas instead of it being a direct menace from Lovecraft, well, well, essentially a lot of stuff is alien menaces. A lot of this stuff for <coughs> oddly enough, this Stephen King also. Uh, uh, even the stuff that isn't an, well, yeah. that directly <laughs> alien can be tied back to the alien stuff. But what, right. True, but I guess what way he bases the ground also is that character drama, like, you know, yeah, the song series. Like the story, it, um, if you took away the clown, you took away those, those moments, there's actually, there's a novel there about being young, um, or me the memory of being young and what you remember you know, I think one of the things to look at is you can look at those flashbacks. I think mean, in a lot of ways they're going to be like meant to be perceived. If, I'm sure the bit of you have read it. Um, most of the parts of children, I think, in some ways are supposed to be like instead of looking back, because yeah. they're so caught up on details, like remembering the songs, remembering yeah. the exact, like trying to remember all the things that made those moments special. That book is about, and the, the core element of it, I mean, even in the dedication, he says to my three children, um, don't forget about the magic. And it's all about the magic and the mysticism and even, even the spirituality of childhood and how anything is possible, how we're invincible, um, untouchable, that kind of aspect. Um, and, but at a certain point in time, when we come of age, something about that breaks, it goes away, and we forget the magic of, you know, the, of that time frame. And in that book, even though you have the, uh, what's the basic childhood fear is clowns. I think that's why he locked on to Pennywise for that book. But the book is so much more than some demonic clown. The book is about the power of childhood, the power of that magic, um, friendship, um, companionship, how we build our first relationships as children and how it gets deeper and more prevalent as the older we get. And how the adult world, the adult disappoints you. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a good one. But part, of, part of the childhood memories are them learning that if they didn't already know quickly that their parents are fallible, that adults are weak a lot of times. They're people. They're, no one's Invincible. Yeah, we all, when, when we're kids, we think our parents, that, that our parents can do nothing, for the most part, the parents can do nothing wrong. And I think it, it speaks a lot to when we do come of age, is about the time we realize that mom and dad aren't perfect, um, or whoever the guardian is in our, uh, in our family life. When we finally realize that, that, that these people who either brought us into the world, these people that we look up to, are not perfect, it does something to us, and it changes the entire outlook. Just like realizing for the first time that death 
you know, you know, it's the end. You know, if something dies, it's not coming back tomorrow. It's that that process. It's, it's a scary time. It's a scary time for anybody. And King likes onto that a lot. That's why he goes back to that over and over again in stories like The Body, in Dreamcatcher. There's even that part. Um, and he tells that same story over and over again, the end of childhood and how terrifying that time can be. And I'm just all good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, I think that's yeah. definitely. Um, and the thing is, one of the things about the king is that, as um, where he sees himself in the literary tradition, he, he's pretty humble in terms of what he thinks of his quality. Yeah. Like, but because he, he's obviously a very well-read person, you can. He's. I mean, he. He's very aware of the classics and like Blake. I'm sure he's. I mean, he he's read. He's a um, traditionally um, reader. He loves new stuff too. But like, it's definitely. He's, he's aware of what he's doing and aware of. But he, he's called himself multiple times, especially in the 90s. Uh, he calls himself the literary equivalent of a Big Mac and fries. <laughs> so he's the, you know, the McDonald's you know, fast food meal of the literary world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a big Stephen King fan. Mm -hmm. I've been for years. Um, my wife's the biggest, though. <laughs> um, she's the 800-pound gorilla in the yeah. when it comes to being a fan of. Do you feel that at some point, though, that he lost his way for a while? He lost his way at least three times in his career, at least. Um, there was the first time was. Uh, That's how you come back stronger, though. It, exactly. Uh, you learn from your mistakes. I think The Outsider is one of his, the, his newest novel that came out this year is one of his strongest performances. I, ever. Um, Revival is one of his strongest novels, and that's a, that's a more recent one also. But the three times I'll bring this up, there's something happened that nobody ever ever talked about. King doesn't talk about it. Daphne, nobody ever talks about it. Some point in time around the Kujo era, he wrote several books uh, and several stories and several scripts about a, uh, a woman uh, being unfaithful to her husband. There was a time that, and he wrote some of the darkest stuff during that period. Now, whether or not Tabitha was unfaithful to him or whether or not he was unfaithful to her, I don't, I don't know. But there, there was a very strong darkness to his work. Um, the ending of Cujo is much different than the ending of the, the movie. Um, I'm not sure. I don't want to spo spoil anything for anybody. But um, there was a, definitely a dark side to King that he finally got out of him around Pet Cemetery. Um, and that pretty much ended that. In fact, he wasn't even going to publish Pet Cemetery because it was sitting in a drawer for, for months and months on end because he didn't think anybody wanted to read that book. It was so dark and depressing, and there's not a, ha there's not a happy thing after the first couple chapters. Um, and then again, uh, he got addicted to cocaine. Not only is that, but he was an alcoholic. Um, and he lost his way again with Tommyknockers. And he'll, t he'll tell you, but at some point in time in Tommyknockers, he went to rehab. And when he came back, he finished the book. The book was was in pieces when he when he, he got so bad. The story goes, Tabitha came walking in, and he was pounding away writing Tommy knockers, and she looked down in the trash can. The trash can was overflowing with bloody uh, napkins or tissues because he'd been stuffing them up his nose because he'd been doing so, so much coke that his nose was just steadily bleeding. Um, and he went. He went away. In fact, in Tommy Knockers, there's a line that says, Guard went for a walk. And the entire tone of the book changes after that. And I believe that's when he came back from, from rehab and he had cleaned himself up. And then, once again, in 1999, he got hit by the van. And his entire everything changed after that. He wrote three of his worst novels, I, I think Dream, Dreamcatcher, uh, Chrome of Ewa Gate, and Cell. I don't like any any of those books, and he doesn't like them either. In fact, when he when they ask him um, what his favorite books are, um, he says, "How about how about we talk about the ones that are the worst?" And he always mentions uh, Tommy Knockers because that's the one where he came back from rehab, and Dreamcatcher because that's the first one he wrote when he after he got back from the accident. He was also on painkillers. A lot. Well, actually, no, he didn't take painkillers uh, from Dreamcatcher when he refused them because he had so many problems with drugs to begin with. Okay. Um, but he would he couldn't write on, at his desk, so Tabitha set him up at the ta kitchen table, and he had his busted leg up, and he wrote the entirety, all 600 manuscript pages is probably more like a thousand pages, 600 well let's just say a thousand in old uh, legal ledgers, um, and it, they were the letter bound ones. He wrote that the entirety of Dreamcatcher, and he got all that pain out 
in there. Um, now, with uh, from a view of Dave, he started that before the, the accident. He finished it afterwards. And Cell, Cell is just a book that I think he, at some point in time he just stopped writing um, because there's really no ending to that book. It just, you know, the way I don't like saying I don't want to spoil it, spoil anything for anybody, but it just stops. So I think he has definitely lost his way several times, and he's always taken a while to come back. He's always taken, but he's one of the, and this is one of the reasons why he's my literary hero is because he has always managed to come back. He has always fought his way back tooth and nail, and he'll be the first one to tell you when he's written a bad book. And that's, I think that's the best part about him, where I do, where you have Dean Coons or any of these other cats out there, is that they're not going to tell you when a book is bad. And he will come out and he will tell you, this book is bad, this movie with my name on it is terrible. He, he thinks uh, Maximum Overdrive is one of the worst movies ever, ever made. And he's, he wrote it and he directed it. Now, it's not so much cocaine, it's that he doesn't it's remember doing it. it it's, it's great in a schlocky B-horror. What's funny is, um, I 100% probably believe that Dreamcatcher is really bad, but that was actually the first book of his. Oh, I read The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon when I was like 11, and I don't remember really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember like. It's got a kid in it. Yeah. It's got a kid in it. I like, I like that mindset. But then, like, I read Dreamcatcher when I was um, 12 or 13, and I just remember at the time I thought it was really cool. Yeah, but there's a lot of fart jokes in that book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that was really my entry into like, I got, I, I can't, I want to read more and more and more. Yeah. And so, in a way, that book was kind of a gateway. And so I had, I have fond memories of it. Yeah. But I know that I probably should let that remain that fond is, memories and not revisit. Yeah, that book is tricksy um, because the first probably 200 pages of that book, amazing, great stuff. Um, and it isn't until um, he starts killing off some great characters. Um, once he kills off the best character in the book, in my opinion, the book is lost. I'm surprised that he even finished it. Because even, even, you can even tell in the text, the text, it doesn't get dumber, but it gets lazier. The, the writing of the book gets lazier after a certain character dies. And he's like, I just want to be, this, be done with this. The problem therein lies... 400 more pages of this book to go before the end of the book. So now we have to trek through. We we spent the first 200 falling in love with these guys, you know, and, and you know, learning everything about them, only to spend the next 400 pages of the book with the guys that nobody cares about. It was a toss away. Go ahead. And that's a recommendation. Go ahead. I'm going to be so far not <laughs> I I have I, I have both read the first I've read the first two books and I've watched the show. I know you can't get catch them, but I do the same thing in my books. So uh, it's but it's not it's not a matter really of him killing the main character. Uh, in fact, I, I respect that getting rid of somebody that you think is going to be around for the whole book. You're you're keeping people on their toes. I respect that. I use it myself. The thing is, you got to have somebody else there to somebody else there to take up. Just like in. Uh, Song of Ice and, uh, Ice and Fire. Once he gets rid of somebody, there is somebody as interesting, if not more interesting, there to take to take that. And I don't think Dreamcatcher has that. Um, Dreamcatcher goes from the most interesting character dead to now we're following around these two guys. I could care less. I mean, I've read the book. You know, I've read the book three times. I study. I study Stephen King like most people study. You know, like Faulkner. You know, that, that's how that I'm a I'm a Stephen King scholar, I guess if you want to call it. If you can if you can call yourself a scholar that way. Um you're talking about a uh, girl who loved Tom Gordon when you were what, eleven? Yeah. My very first Stephen King memory is uh, I grew up in Fontana, California and we had a drive in movie theater. I'm sure most of you guys remember the drive in theaters. And Pet Cemetery was out. I was nine years old. Um, <laughs> my please stop mentioning that <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. No. No. No more. No more. No more dates. I was in high school when I read Fury. Ah. Well, you know, I think, but I think that's one of. I think that goes hand in hand with what we're discussing here. So the longevity of this stuff is that it doesn't. It's. And I think that speaks to why this is. I think a relevant conversation because he himself is getting up there in age. And I don't mean that insulting way. He. It's just. It's a natural. Yeah. It's a natural fact of life. But it seems like, if anything, I mean, they're making, his stuff is doing as well as ever. I mean, it was huge. I mean, it was huge. I think that it surpassed what they ever thought it would do. Right. 
Um, yeah. You know, yeah, nobody saw that one coming. That you know, show, nobody saw this like, coming. I think the show's fine. I remember when people lost their minds over Stranger Things. I was just like, this is just Steve. This is just the Stephen King playbook, like, or, you know, scripture and verse. And so I mean, like, it's like obvious, but I mean, like, people still love it. So I mean, it's like, well, clearly that this goes to show that he can he taps into something. Yeah. He ha he has a even like secondhand his stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it works for people. It works for younger people. It works for older people. And I think that's that's really interesting. That's, that says something about a writer. Because a lot of times, you know, there's some there's you know people like James Patterson. And I'm not this. I'm not trying to go into any kind of like of quality. Don't get, don't get, but there's been authors like him who put hundreds of books out in their lifetime. And no one knows his name. Right. They might have been huge then. No one. Or people know the characters. They don't know. Yeah. You know. They don't know the author. That kind of thing. Um, but real quick, the the pet cemetery story. Was my mom took me to drive in. I would. I wasn't really supposed to be there, but my dad didn't want to watch me. That's a whole story in itself. But um, so they, her, and her friend and Rita were going to uh, go see pet cemetery, and they didn't have anything to do with me. She put me in the back seat. And I'm in the back seat doing my own thing, chilling in the box, hiding behind the, because they told me it was a horror movie. I wasn't too much into horror when I was dying. But uh, at one point in time, I looked around the the chair, the, dri the driver's seat, and Zelda was on the screen. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the Pet Cemetery movie, but she's the one with the spine. It, it, she's all like that. I beat myself. I was nine years old. I saw that, and but the, the crazy, even though I had that 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 accident, um, I knew that that anybody that could get that kind, even at nine years old, anybody that could get that kind of reaction from me, I wanted to look farther into. Um, when I got home, I I noticed that mom had Pet Cemetery on her shelf, and I picked up. She's like, No, no, no! I said, I just watched. I just watched. <laughs> yes, but the book is much worse. <laughs> Anyways, um, but uh, w my mother also had this uh, this thing, the, the great book closet. She had this huge walk-in book closet, and most of the stuff, once I once I hit the age where I was reading other things other than like Goosebumps, she would stick like uh, like Gerald's game went, in, went into the <laughs> closet, because that's about a woman who is chained to a bed naked, you know. Her husband just had a heart attack right before they're about to have sex. Um, so, of course, she didn't want me to read that one. It just um, made a movie out of that scene. Yeah, exactly, which was terrific. It was one of the best that I've I wanted to read. And it got to a point where um, she, she wouldn't let me read anything from him because I was obsessed with you know wanting to read more. And the very first Stephen King book that I read was Dolores Claiborne because it came oh, really? yes it came in the mail because she was part of the Stephen King uh, Library book club, whatever. Not, it wasn't... It wasn't like Book of the Month Club. It was all they sent were Stephen, Stephen King books. That's it. Yeah. Um, and it came in, and I saw Stephen King Book Club. And I, I stole it out of the mailbox, and I tore it open, and I went in my room. I read it over the course of two nights. I was 13 years old. book came out in, I think, 92, 93. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And that, that, was, that was it. I haven't looked back since. I've been a fan ever since that book. Yeah. There's something about, I, I'll always remember, um, there was something, not only was it adult, but it was, it was very childlike. Also, it, it was so. It was written in a way that I could understand everything that was going on. I didn't. He wasn't talking down to me. He was just telling me a story, and that's what I like to do. I like to tell stories, and I like to have stories told to me. I've always been a fan of stories, um, and that's where he excels. Is he tells the simplest stories in the best way? Exactly. It's sincere. He doesn't feel like he's trying to be pretentious. He doesn't use fancy words. He doesn't. Um, he, is, he is very literary, though. He has theme, thematic qualities. He is a terrific literary author. But that he just so happens to write about, you know, uh, killing chattery teeth and, you know, demonic clowns and crazy number one fans and that kind of thing. But there is still literary merit with him. Um, and it does, it does aggravate me a bit when I, oh, well, he doesn't just, he just writes horror. One of my favorite stories from Stephen King is a personal story of him when he was at the grocery store. And an old woman came up to say, oh, you're that Stephen King guy, aren't you? You write all those horror novels. Said, yes, ma'am, I am. Said, Why don't you write you know, good stories like that Shawshank Redemption? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I, I wrote that. I actually wrote that. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, I like that story. And that's the, 
That's the kind of stories he tells. You know, those little pieces, little slices of life. It's fun. Well, it's good to me, so I think what, what we've been dressing in, I think, people that he does strike a chord with people. And so it's, um, the question is, and I, the question is, two part. One is, um, do you, do you think that this will continue to be like read? And do you think, do you think like as we, the prompt sort of suggests, do you think people could, do you think writers could really write with his material? Like, hey, to take his premise, take his Salem's Lot and write a Salem's Lot novel, or to take um, an it, write an it novel, or a Dark Tower novel? Is, is it, yeah, they lead themselves not to do that. Um, we're already seeing with Joe Hill, um, with his son, we're already seeing. Um, he, had, in fact, his newest, I'll, I'll get you in just, just a second. Um, with his novel, The Fireman, um, in fact, I was kind of disappointed. That I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Joe Hill fan, I like Joe Hill. But for those of you that don't know, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. And Owen yeah. King and Tabitha King, and they're all writers. The only one who isn't a writer is Naomi, which is his daughter, and she's a pastor, I think. She's yeah, a great yeah. Unitarian, I think. Um, but with uh, Joe Hill's The Fire, I was kind of disappointed because he, the book is one big Stephen King Easter egg hunt. Um, instead of Joe Hill doing his own thing, uh, telling his own story, uh, I mean, it has, you have a, a deaf kid in there named Nick. There's a deaf, there's a deaf character named Nick in the stand. Uh, the, 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 there's so many nods to his, his dad's work. There's even a part where it says, you've forgotten the face of your father, my life for you. All that stuff is from Stephen King's work. So you're already seeing it, and I know, I know Joe is going to continue on with that also. Do I think that other authors can take up that mantle? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the reasons I think Lovecraft's estate has lasted, and so many people have, because there, there wasn't that, uh, how can I, I guess the copyright side of things. Didn't copyright. Co yeah, exactly. Um, I think it was more, it's, it's kind of like Night of the Living Dead. George Romero never copyrighted that. That's why you have so many, um, so many productions of Night of the Living Dead. And you have so many zombie movies and that, that, uh, that specific thing. So I don't know that you'll see anybody else other than his family do it. Well, he's also he very generous about the adaptation. Supposedly that you can make a film adaptation for a dollar of this. Yeah, so um, you can do it with Carrie. Um, Carrie's had three adaptations so far because that one's in the in the public uh, public domain now. You can you can make oh, really? yeah you can oh, yeah you can make a movie of of Carrie no problem. Um, the movie rights are completely open to everybody. Um, but Stephen King doesn't care as far as the movies are concerned. He doesn't, it, 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 he doesn't care if they're good, bad, or indifferent. I remember him, in the, the same week, he said the Dark Tower movie was fine, go see it, it's another turn of the wheel. And the very same week, he said, this movie's trash. <laughs> so, yeah, you can't, you, but it, it, movie-wise, he doesn't care. The, the, what he knows, he, he knows for a fact, and it's been proved, proven throughout his entire career, is that Anytime somebody makes a garbage movie out of one of his books, people just go back and buy the book. So no matter what, he, they're always going to come back to him. Um, I don't know. There might be more. I mean, there was a sequel to Salem's Lot um, that nobody ever talked about. I mean, they, they shouldn't, but it was, it was really, really oh, bad. The, um, the TV one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the return to Salem's Lot. Or something like that. It was cool. That was, that was bad. Um, so people are pl still playing in this sandbox, but um, as far as like a literary thing, we're seeing like Victor Laval just recently did the Ballad of Black Tom, mm -hmm. which is it, yeah, it's one of my favorite books from that year, um, which is a riff on uh, the horror or a riff book mm -hmm. uh, from Lovecraft. Very racist book. Yeah, very <laughs> racist book. And then a black man came and wrote uh, the, the the Ballad of Black Tom, which which Lovecraft would have. <laughs> would have thought impossible because he thought they were nothing but apes. Um, black people were nothing but apes um, or gorillas, something like that. I, I can't remember his, he used to, in his letters, his letters were super racist. Um, but, uh, and then to have a black man come and do it better, I think that, I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think that, I don't think it would be done with King while King's living. I, I don't think, um, now well, there, he said he would love to see more Dark Tower stories. So will we see more in that? Who, who knows? But is he also talking about maybe Hill doing it? 
Yeah. I don't know, because Hill's been playing with the inscapes in his book. Uh, NOS 4A2 or Nosferatu, what do you want to call it? Um, that one talks that Pennywise makes it, well, doesn't make an appearance, but he mentions Pennywise. Um, and yeah, he like goes the, the, was it the interstate? Yeah, the, the, the inscapes and the interstates yeah. of the mind. Yeah, I thought that was a very cool concept. Um, and in that little map area, he has Midworld. And Midworld is basically, uh, it, it's, Tolkien had Middle Earth, Stephen King had Midworld, um, has Midworld. Um, so that's his, his fantasy realm where everything is kind of, all story has come together. Um, there's a point in the very, uh, not very last, uh, the fourth, fifth, fifth Dark Tower novel, um, where he talks about characters that are part Harry Potter, part uh, DC Comics, part this, that he, it's all, all stories. And he, him, he himself, like one of his favorite books of all time is Lord of the Flies. Um, and he, he's always used, as, and one hint, aspect of his stuff is his own fandom. Like, you know, you, he has a lot of books about children. What is one of his favorite books? You know, Lord of the Flies. Same thing. It just goes full circle. Um, I, I really don't know, Anthony. It's a, it's a good question. Um, Would you try it yourself? I think I'm going to write my own stories. Now, if, now, okay, if Stephen King or somebody affiliated with him came and said, hey, we want you to write a Dark Tower <laughs> novel, am I going to say yes? Yeah, I'm going to say yes. You know, if, because that's just another stepping stone in the career. Um, but would it be something that I would be passionate about? I can't say that I would. I, I, think, it would, I think I would want to create my own my own world, but what I do, uh, yeah, of course I do it. You know, if somebody asks me to do it, especially if he asked me to do it, if he had called me up and said, hey, you want to write a book with me? Sure, even though I hear you're a jerk when it comes to writing with people. Peter Straub and him stopped talking for 12 years um, after they wrote uh, the, the Talisman together. Um, and then they came back and they did Black House, but uh, some funny stories hearing those guys talk about how much they hated each other. Uh, well, how much Straub hated King because King was so, uh, it's all about me and my vision. And Straub, <laughs> Straub's another one who is all about his vision, but the, the messed up part is King called Straub, said, hey, you write exactly like I do. I disagree, by the way. I don't, I don't, I don't think they write anything alike. Um, they're both wordy, but Straub is verbose. Straub will throw 8,000 words at you and he's they, more of a stylist. Yeah, he's 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 a literary author. Um, he he likes wordplay and all that stuff. King will throw eight thousand words at you, and you'll just be in, trapped by you know all the all the intricacies of that you know of, of those pages. Um, whereas Straub is way too big for my liking. Uh, there's no point to half of this stuff. Either that, or you have to dig for ages to try and figure out what he meant by a certain thing. Um, and if you ask him, like, oh, it's there, it's there. You just have to figure it out. Where Stephen King, he doesn't leave. He doesn't leave the the writing isn't the mystery. The story, the mystery is left to the story. And I, I prefer that. I don't. I don't. Well, I do read some stuff to to study the language and to improve craft. Um, but that's not fun. I mean, that, that's cool. Uh, let's let's be honest. Um, so, some people it is it is fun it's to do fun that. For me. But, it's fun for me reading. I like. I love it. There like, you go. But I can appreciate. I mean, there's more than one way of writing. That's and there's more, there's definitely yeah. more than one way of reading, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to... Yeah, I'll say, on that topic, I mean, like the last short story collection came out. Mm -hmm. The Bizarre Batman. Bizarre Batman, yeah. Where, I mean, he's almost saying, go for it. Because he's writing a whole book of stories where he's writing, like, people's other people. He likes. It, it's funny when so he... It's almost like, that was that question. Well, when he, when he... It's funny, because he, he talks about it in the afterword. He, every single story has an afterword. Um, or is it the, is it beforehand? Yeah, it's the, the it's the intro. Yeah. Okay, um, I knew it was, it was one or the other. But every single one of those stories, like okay, when I wrote this story, I was reading a lot of what Herman Walk. Uh, he was reading a lot of Lawrence. Uh, I can't Lawrence Block, or he was reading a lot of this author. And when you read that, even even at seventy years old, the guy's still a mimic. I mean, he's still writing like whoever he's reading, and that's another reason why. You know, Bean Coots only writes like Bean Coots. You know, he, he never sounds like anybody else. And that's another reason why Stephen King stays so fresh, is because he is a mimic. You know, he'll, it, you never know what each book is going to And right now, he writes like his son, which is completely backwards. It's blowing my mind. It's like, <laughs> him and Joe Hill, uh, if, you, if you were to pick up 
The Outsider, and pick up Nosferatu, and read those two books back to back, you would swear to the same author, or The Fireman. Let's, let's do the most recent from each. The Fireman and uh, The Outsider. It's the, almost the exact same voice. You wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Whereas there was one point in time when you could pick up a Stephen King novel and go, that's Stephen King. You know, it's some things like close enough for government work. There's some idioms in there that, that he has that only he, a uh, yeah. You know, if you've ever been to Maine, you know, instead of get, saying yes, a uh, yeah. Uh, and that's something that he used all the time. And if you read stuff like that, you like, well, that's, that's from Stephen King. You know, that is, there's nowhere else that that is. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's some other stuff, but right now, if you were to pick up the news book from both those guys, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I, I swear that Joe Hill could have written The Outsider. I wouldn't know the difference. So. Also, the other hand? Anybody else? I have one. But yeah, yeah. Okay. You were talking about you know, um, how can other people write in his voice? I feel like Robert Cannon oh. completely lifted the stand and swan song and turned it into the swan song. Yeah. I mean, because it's got some of the characters with the same name. Yeah. Captain Trip or Mr. Trips is in there. Yeah. Borrows a flag. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have. There's. It's fun, it's funny that you bring that up because I don't, the with McCammon and King. I, the, there is a huge chasm between their writing styles. Their stories mimic each other quite a bit. Um, in fact, if you read They Thirst and Salem's Lot together, you will notice that McCann looks at some stuff from, but of course, you ask some people to say he does it better. Um, but I, I don't feel that way. But uh, with Swan Song is a better overall experience um, than The Stand is, and I get I get argued this a lot, um, so it's funny to have it brought up. But uh, the 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 problem with the stand, the uncut version, is there's a whole bunch of information there in the middle of the book where they're rebuilding that town that has nothing to do with the rest of the book. It is so out of place. Um, in fact, I think a lot of it's even in the cut version. If you guys don't know, the original stand was like 800 pages. Then he re-released another one that was 1,200 pages. Um, so the one was in like the 80, one was in the 80s and one was in the 90s, um, and that, that no matter what you have that rebuilding of society, um, just that that one little section that is so out of place, um, it's almost uh, I know what I, I know what he's trying to do. He was trying to give you a brief glimpse of hope um, before he tore it all down again. Um, but then he got stuck, and he's like, okay, I realize that I am writing the wrong story. I am writing this story about rebuilding society, and I have no care to write that. So what does he do? He thinks dynamite just blows up half the town. <laughs> it's like, uh, I have all these characters. I don't know what to do with them. I don't even like them. What do I do with them? OK, let's get rid of them. Let's just, and he, he said that before. I had a load of characters, nothing to do with them, so I blow them up. Um, but Swan Song, I don't think there's a lull in that book. I don't think there's a point in that book where I looked at it, and I was like, I wish you would get on with the point. Um, and McCammon, for, for the faults that he had early in his career, he can't stand his first four novels. Um, and he, he, he likes them all right now, but there was a point in time where he, uh, yeah, um, that he considered them the worst books ever written. Not, not just he ever wrote, but you know, ever written. And to an extent, I almost agree, because they were very schlocky, they were very B-rated, um, and he was so much better. And you can feel the growing things when you read those first four books. Like, I want to do more. I want to write a mystery walk, or a boy's life, or a gone south, or a swan song. But I'm just not quite there yet. So he wrote those first, I mean, the, the first one is Ball, which was B-A-A-L, which was some kind of, he didn't know if he wanted to do The Exorcist or some big god novel, but whatever it was, it ended up being a 300-page 300, 300 book um, that just goes everywhere, from some Rosemary baby fiction there at the beginning to literally fighting a god. Um, and then Bethany's Sin was a kind of a weak attempt at uh, a feminist literature from a man's point of view, where um, yeah, I guess he figured that this town full of women killing men was the right message. I'm not sure exactly where he was going with that one. Um, and then you had a, a Night Boat, which was actually written before Bethany's Sin, 
uh, Night Boat was literally a zombie novel about a Nazi U-boat filled with zombies. And they thirst, man, uh, they thirst makes me laugh every time I read it because they literally control a tornado. At one of the vampires in the book control a tornado. And I was like, this, okay, so shark nato, we got vamp nato. <laughs> um, and uh, we've got, I've gotten off on the canon, but there was a time when the canon was better than King, and that was when King wasn't King. King, King was going down the tubes really quick um, with his addiction. And mind you, had he not had that addiction, we wouldn't have got it, we wouldn't have got misery, we wouldn't have got so many great novels out of that. Uh, but the guy was killing himself, um, trying to be the best, and trying to pump out novel after novel. Um, well, you know, I think he also, going back to his influences, he's a, he's a big fan of Charles Dickens, mm -hmm. and Charles Dickens has you know, long, complex novels, so I think that was sort of his longer is more serious, is more, is better, so it had to be, yeah. if it's going to be a real story, the book has to be the size of a brick. It, it, it's funny because, I mean, the reason why Dick and Bibles were so big was because they were serialized. Yeah. Um, they really had nothing to do with him wanting to write big, sweeping novels. He needed enough, he needed enough material so that he could serialize each and everything and make each experience as long as the next, right? Um, and then they put it all together and he just happened to have a of 900 page, uh, what's the Bleak House. House? Bleak House. You end up with something like Bleak House. Um, whereas Stephen King, I, don't still, I think Stephen King has way too much fun with what he does. I think oh. Stephen King gets in there and he has a blast um, and he's just going to sit there and he's going to write every little detail um, about these people because he finds that fun. And I actually tend to agree most times. Well, when he wrote uh, The Green Mile, I think. Yeah. And he wrote that like a dick. I mean, he did the same thing he wrote. And I kind of wonder, did he actually know where he was going no. when he started? Or did he just start writing? And I wonder if that's one reason we still don't know what kind of with Drew. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, with, with Drew, yeah. I, there's a really, I don't know if you've uh, read this. Uh, Dan Simmons wrote a book called Drew. Um, that is, it, it's it's great it's great historical fiction uh, fictionalized version of uh, of fact. But um, with King, King had no idea uh, where he was going when he when he started the Green Mile. Um, <laughs> he said, "All I knew is that um, the guy came to me, um, one of his longtime editors. This is what this is the story he tells. Uh, he said, hey, uh, I want you to do a, a serialized novel.' He goes, well, I kind of have an idea of a prison.'" I said, you already did Shawshank. He's like, no, I want to do something else. I want to do something that's really going to um, break a few hearts. And so he started slapping all this together. And it's funny, you can tell the first five of those, they're really thin, like they're all 98 pages, I think. I think all the first five, then the last one's like 150. So it's like, I got to wrap this up at some point in time. We can't be here. But, but no, he didn't know where he was going. And he wrote it every single month. He wrote a new episode. Well, that's what, why I was wondering, because I, I kind of thought he was originally going to like make it a little darker mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, having, you know, the, I mean, like, you know, that somehow, you know, there was, uh, that's his, that's what I call his Oscar book. Yeah, well, he, was, he was writing that so, <laughs> so that he could write, so they could make an Oscar nominated movie well, out of it. King is, I mean, you know, for, I remember, when I was a kid, you know, he still had, it's kind of gone now, but he still had a bad boy rep kind of a thing. And people like, you know, oh, you know. He was so nerdy. That's the best part about it. He was like the bad boy nerd. Well, that, his, was the, that was the best stuff part of it. Are about good versus evil, which yeah. good usually overcoming. The, his books are mostly about the idea of decency and the idea of not necessarily, like, not necessarily hard, like, like, being parents became very spiritual. He was always there, but more so to the point where his stuff is kind of inspirational. Really, yeah, he, he, he loves a happy ending. Um, well, King doesn't care. Well, King will. I mean, they normally will come and just. And good endings aren't all. They're not. You lose limbs or fingers. Yeah, or, right. You know, you, you don't. You don't get out of it unscathed. But he has the idea that being a good, decent person will overcome yeah. what happens. And so I think you know, I. It's, he had those peer reviews that goes dark. He always, like, he can't stop himself yeah. from, like, bringing things back to, yeah. like... It's
it's like he says, like I, no matter what he says, no matter what I write, I will always come back to horror. No matter what he writes, no matter how literary it is, there's always a horror aspect. Um, what if we can go down the list, like any of his stuff, like the uh, um, Shawshank Redemption, the intense, the the rape of the main character over and over again. I think it's been like three months of the main character being raped by, you know, in prison, in a prison setting, I and mean, that's horrific. You go with the body, which is a, a piece of literary fiction, but it's about them going to find a dead body, you know, and that, there's your horror aspect of it. So everything that he writes, even Lisey's story, um, which is a, is a literary novel um, that is all about theme and passion and growing old with uh, the one that you love or without the one that you love, um, even that has horror elements to it. So he always falls back on what he does well, which is, you know, the whether if it's not scaring you. Uh, remember, he, there was a three D disgust. If I can't disgust you, I I want to uh, give you a sense of dread. Um, if I can't give you a sense of dread, I'm just gonna kill everybody. So you got dread, disgust, and death. So either you're dreading something's gonna happen. You're watching something, you know, somebody dying or whatever it may be, or he's just going to try and disgust you like he did in uh, a tight place, which is about a guy who ends up getting stuck inside a porta potty that's been turned over. Um, that is one of the most disgusting stories. But he, but he's not. He doesn't draw a line anywhere. He he's written about just about everything. Um, I don't. I, I can't tell you any other author who has written about, you know, a killer. It's not even a killer, but like a, a one of those symbol monkeys. I mean, he, he used that for a horror story, and then turn around, you got writing about clowns, vampires, uh, the number one fan. You got the newest. He even created a whole new monster, or whatever you want. To, I don't, I don't want to spoil it. There's a whole new uh, menacing entity in The Outsiders. He's still creating things, um, but he takes the every day, and he will make it frightening. And I, I think that's from the very name of this conversation. We clearly were not going to have an answer to this question because you know we don't know. But then we don't have an answer. Yeah. You know, we don't know if it's going to, if his legacy is going to. I'm sure his legacy will go on. Yeah. But I don't. I don't know that other people will will take up torch other than his kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's clearly a lot of well now, and I thank you all for coming and participating in this conversation. Thank um, you for the questions yeah. and everything. I appreciate and it. Has he, has, he ever, uh, has he ever come up to say what his favorite or some of his favorite novel or? Yeah, um, one of them, he says the one that inspired him the most is Arthur Machen's uh, The Great God Pan. Um, that's one of his biggest inspirations. In fact, when he wrote his novelette N, just the letter N, um, and his novel Revival, they'll deal with those themes quite a bit, and also uh, Lord of the Flies, like I discussed earlier, uh, is one of his favorite novels. Um, he's also a huge fan of men's adventure novels, um, just the, you know, the big tough guy saving the damsel in distress, that kind of thing. He loved that stuff, and just cheese, the cheesiest, the, the worst science fiction you, you've ever seen. He, he likes the kind of thing where you see the monster, and you can see the strings pulling it up, you know, you can see the boom mic coming into, into frame. Has he ever acknowledged what he thought was his strongest novel? His? Oh. Or he um, that he considered his favorite. Probably yeah. Like and the whatever new book he has. But in, all, in fact, his quote, his quote is, isn't it funny how our parts always smell the best to us? Um, so he thinks one of his best novels is, that's his quote, by the way, um, not mine, um, is Lisey's story. Uh, he thinks it's his most powerful work. Um, and nobody's going to, I promise you, nobody's going to remember it. Um, it's going to be one of those, people are going to remember him, Tabitha even says, people are going to remember him for the S novels. Uh, the Stand, The Shining, and Salem's Lot. That's what people are going to remember him for. I thought Kerry was pretty strong. Yeah. And, and it, I, I mean, he's got more. I mean, definitely, yeah. yeah. We, well, we, we, okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank, thank you all you. again for coming. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the guys.